Welcome to another exciting episode of Love Her Podcast. I'm your host, Nicole Amy Schreiber, and I'm a comedian, and comedy's back in Los Angeles. So head over to my social media so you can find out where and when I'm performing. April 17th, I will be opening for Eliza Schlesinger, two shows in Hollywood at the Whitley. It's on her social media, at Eliza S. Go check it out. Get tickets. She's a beast. I'm a beast. You can see two bad bitches doing comedy. Um... And it's just a good night out on the town. It's, you know, COVID safe, you know, socially distanced outside, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, But let's get into the podcast today. Uh, As always, Love Her Podcast is brought to you by loveherfeet.com, where you can dot com. Uh, Today, we have a very special episode. I've I'm really excited about this one because I always love speaking to uh, medical professionals, people who have uh, that fancy doctor before their name because they know shit and I love that. Um, She's an author. She has a new book that just came out called Playing With Your Partner, A Single's Guide to Sex, Dating and Happiness. She is a uh, sexologist. We'll get into what that is because I don't exactly know. She's a relationship expert and a body image specialist. Put your hands and feet together for Dr. Megan Stubbs. Hi, (laughs) thanks for having me on the podcast. Oh my gosh, I'm so, I love anybody who's a doctor for me. I'm like, you've studied a lot, you know things, I need to get inside your brain. Um, And this is really (laughs) exciting because you're a doctor of literally one of my favorite things in the world, which is sex, so. Yeah. It's, I it's thought a, I'm a medical doctor, so I'm. Listen, I know I'm it's a doctor, not a like medical doctor, <laughs> but like you're still a doctor. You're still doctor to me. Just means somebody who went to school for a really long time and knows a lot of shit. <laughs> There's no way sure. you're gonna oh, have yeah. a doctor before your name and not know things that I don't know. And that applies to all <laughs> doctors. Okay, that's so fair. Now I need to know things. Um, well, thank you so much for uh, coming on the podcast. I always appreciate uh, every single one of our guests that come on. Um, and I'm really excited to, I have not read your book yet, but I, after reading the description of it, it couldn't be more appropriate for me because I am a, uh, I don't want to say chronically single person um, because that makes it sound negative. Um, and I don't think it is. And I think you would agree with that, but I, uh, I'm not, I'm, uh, I'm single a lot. So I want to, I want to find out how to move past that, but I want to start first with sexologist. What exactly is that? So I say that's the job you didn't see on career day. I basically research what people do with their bodies and see how they feel about it. Okay. Interesting. And, and is there, when you're in school, I mean, I don't, not only did I not see that on career day, but I did not see that on the course offering um, when I was in college. Is this kind of like a make your own degree? Is this, uh, how did this come about in college? Yeah, so degree is actually in biology. And so growing up, I was always that friend you'd come to for like sex advice or like what's blow jobbing? And I'd be like, let me tell you all. <laughs> And so that was always like an interest. I was thirst for knowledge. And so I was reading every book or magazine I could get my hands on. And I was like also really good at science. So I said, okay, I'll go to school to be a medical doctor. And so I was great at biology. So I made that my degree with a pre-med emphasis. And it was great until I started taking chemistry classes. Then things did not gel. And so I was like, oh crap, (laughs) what am I going to do with this degree? Because I just couldn't continue doing chemistry classes. It was killing my GPA, killing my life. Like it was horrible. So I was actually consciously reading Cosmo at the time. And I saw the word sexologist and I was like, is that your real job? And so like I Googled back then, I'm sexology degree. And sure enough, there was a grad school at the time offering graduate degrees in human sexuality. And I was like, boom, that's for me. And so after I graduated with my undergraduate degree in biology, I went to school and then got through human sexuality. And so a lot of people there have backgrounds in psychology, biology, nursing, um, medical, clergy, religion studies, social work. So it's a really big like conglomeration of different backgrounds all approaching sex in their unique perspectives. So for me, I love the science, I love the sex. <laughs> yeah, it's so, it's interesting. I, uh, I created a TV show that never went anywhere years ago called uh, The Science of Sex. 
um because i am those are my two i was pre-med so those are my two favorite things um and i as well got you know wiped out from the chemistry i was like mm chemistry is too hard but the biology was always fascinating and um the psychology part was always fascinating but the chemistry never never gelled um what what sort of you know when you were younger and you i i similar as well was that friend who like everybody came to what was it that you what is it that you knew that other people didn't know and how is that like, were you researching I, stuff when you were younger? Like, how did you know, how did you know that? And how did everybody know, like, you were the one to go to? <laughs> um, so I was the one who had all the books, all the books about puberty and changing body. And of course, it was my group, I'd be like, guys, did you know this? Or like, check this out, this fun fact I learned. And it wasn't being taught in school. So then, it, you know, run, travel through the kind that like, hey, she knows all about this, sending out books to friends and having them research and, you know, find out things off their own bodies, but it wasn't being taught in school. And I was like, how is that possible? Uh, we finally got sex that I think, well, we got a like puberty menstruation, talk, which was terrible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we didn't have real like sex ed, reproductive health wasn't sex ed mm -hmm. until maybe 10th grade. And so, okay, let's not be naive here and think people aren't touching themselves or other people. So you just had to do a lot of self-exploration and research because it wasn't offered anywhere else. Is this something your parents were open with with you? Because like my mom was a doctor and, you know, she was always very big on like not having silly names for anything. Like when I was a little, little kid, she, our name for a vagina was a CC. But as soon as I was like, you know, old enough, she'd be like, that's a vagina, that's a penis. You know, she would like, everything was very like, this is the human body, you know, there's nothing to be ashamed of. Were, were your parents like that as well? Yeah, I'm super open and there were no rules when it came to buying books about changing bodies. So, I mean, she probably was like, we're buying a lot of few books, <laughs> but it was never a sense of like shame or like stop reading about this or, you know, having strange names for body parts. It was just very, comfortable and normal like you know vulva labia yeah. menstruation periods and stuff like that so it wasn't ever like a you're down there or your dirty parts or your hoo-ha and it's like yeah what <laughs> just vagina we don't call elbow or nose anything different we just say the name of it yeah is. we don't um other than a nose is a schnoz but yeah we don't there's no other uh <laughs> we have to make up cute names for the the taboo parts of the body um now when you first realized, oh my God, this is something I could do. What is it that you at first wanted to accomplish when you're like, all right, I'm going to be a sexologist. This is my goal. You know, I want, I want this to be, you know, my life's work kind of thing. I was like, I'm going to write so many books and I'm going to be the new authority on sex education. It's a decade and I'm just now writing my first book. So lofty dreams are one thing, but then actually going out and doing the work. Me specifically finished grad school. I came back home Michigan, and that was a blog writing or guest writing for people's um, websites and then doing media work. So uh, co-hosting nighttime radio show, appearing on our local women's outings, doing that kind of stuff. And then getting that experience in media brought on new opportunities to grow into bigger audiences and, and led to more writing. <laughs> but now like, I mean, long in the game, now I'm actually writing a book book because mm -hmm. I didn't know what it took to write a book. I was just like, Oh, I'm just gonna crank out books like one a year. Yeah. That's not how it works. <laughs> young, young Maggie had big ideas. <laughs> I mean, you got, you got to dream big. And I, I appreciate <laughs> that, you know, you wanted big things and sometimes they take a long time, but I feel like you're better for that because I feel like now that you have so much under your belt, like this book is, if you had put this book out a few years ago, it probably wouldn't be nearly as good as it is now knowing as much as you do. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> why did you choose to focus on singleness for your first book of, of all the sexual things to focus on? Why singleness? I was connected to the publisher by a mutual friend. I said, Hey, I, you know, are you for a new author to tackle these And they said, I had to pitch the food and sex cookbook and they were like, no, not the time. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so are you looking for an author to tackle any new topics? And they're like, 
hey, we have this idea of like a single sonality book. And I was like, what? That's my life. Like, <laughs> tell me more. And so it was just like a book about how to be happy being single. And I was like, oh my God, I have a wealth of knowledge from my personal life. And also I can sprinkle in stuff from professional life. So it just seemed like a really natural fit because yeah. I am a single sexologist. <laughs> May I ask how old you are? Is that okay? Yeah, I'm 34. Do you feel like as a woman, I'm in my early to mid late thirties. Um, do you feel like uh, singleness? I mean, I, I know the answer to this, but I, I kind of want to like dive into it with you. Um, singleness is different in your twenties and your thirties. There's different, I don't want to say like things at stake, but um, I feel like it's psychologically easier and more uh footloose and fancy free to be single in your 20s versus your 30s when it's like all right tick tock like i only have so long you know if if your biological clock is exploding it's hard to just be like single and fun in your 30s you know yeah i can definitely see that um for me biological clock's not ticking because i have kids so Obviously, I think everyone's point of view of the single time and their age bracket is different. But I think culturally, it's a lot to be a single 20 because they're like, you're so young, you have time, no rush. Mm -hmm. But then as you get into the older ages, it's like, oh, you're still single, what's wrong with you? Let's fix you up with someone. It's just the yeah. expectations of society. But I think more seeing people being more individualized and being able to choose and say, hey, I don't need to settle down with someone in my twenties. Like I'm going to wait and do all these things guys, personal wise, or just whatever. And mm -hmm. the right person can come along. If it's my thirties, forties, well, you know, whatever happens, happens. One of the things you spoke about, um, uh, well, that was spoken about in the, the press kit that I got, um, is being able to have a fulfilling sex life, um, outside of you know it's like when you're with someone and you can have repetitive um you know uh good habit building sex where you kind of get to know one another how is it that you can make that kind of translate to being single you know and having connected informative uh you can't really build a sexual relationship with someone you're having sex with for the first time so how do you do that like what's your tip I guess yeah there's actually a chapter called sex with strangers <laughs> in the book I mean and so <laughs> um a lot of that is being stuff earlier in the book about like getting in touch with yourself so really romancing yourself and getting in touch with your body and finding out what you what specific kind of sensations and touches what you get into food and then also being your own best lover because some people maybe say you were in a long-term relationship and you find yourself newly single and you're like I don't know where to begin trying to find a new normal where you sexually by yourself can be a challenge because you're so used to being with a partner and having sex with them mm -hmm. so I think it's really empowering to have sex with yourself and oh my god like that was a hot sex session mm -hmm. I'm <laughs> like I don't know else it's fine to have someone else but like I don't I don't need it because I'm good by myself yeah and so Speaking of that knowledge you have for your, when you're going to be having sex with a stranger and playing with someone else, you can say, hey, news. I really like it when you blank my blank or when you do this. I love it, you know, and then you can take that information and impart it to them so they can be like, oh, cool. Thanks. For so again, at the root of everything when it comes to sex, communication is paramount everything boils out of communication. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting that that is the that is the biggest reoccurring theme in almost every interview I do um, when it comes to, you know, even, you know, uh, someone who's in porn having sex, you know, with someone who it's like it's their job. It's still the communication aspect of it can never be overlooked in in any way. Um, I feel like yeah, our no mind reader. Yeah. No one's a mind reader, but I also feel like, you know, you mentioned, you know, uh, the culture that we're in the, I think women are obviously better at communicating because we're, you know, we're taught to like have emotions, feel your emotions, express your emotions, but don't express them too much to a man. Cause they'll never understand. Um, 
I feel like uh, we're moving towards, you know, I notice in younger generations, like everybody is very verbal and communicating, you know, the whole idea of like consent, you know, for example, you know, it is, I see these younger generations having more of a vocabulary for intimacy uh, than, you know, our generation where it's a little more like, you know, don't really say anything. Um, do you, do you, do you see that as well? Is that something you see in our culture? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think we're getting better when it comes to sex education and there are more avenues accessible to the younger generation, whether that's through social media or blogs, websites, books that are more normative. I mean, like you can go to Target now and find a book on sex and that wouldn't give it back in the day. We have to go to a specific bookstore in the back bottom shelf, two shelves of like relationship mm -hmm. self-help. Mm -hmm. But now it's like, you can see it, you know, grocery store. So I think that's really great. It's helping them, like you said, develop a vocabulary and help them be more authentic in their interactions. Um, but I definitely think we can take a page at our age or older from that and say, it matter. Like, it's tough. nobody knows what you want or no one knows that the thing they're doing, you don't like, you know? Yeah. I think the whole faking orgasms things, I hope the trend that's slowly going away, it's like a trope or joke happen in like movies or tv shows and every time i'd be like why why are we doing this like why are we reinforcing bad behavior having to feel like we have to fake it to like build someone's ego up do i mean you don't feel... obviously say like this is the thing, but you be authentic do you feel like i'm thinking about the times like i've faked it and i think about like oh yeah i'm like worried about hurting their feelings or whatever but there's also this part of me that's like sometimes has faked it to be like, all right, let's wrap, wrap this up. I gotta, gotta get moving. Or I, it's almost this like, not so much like worrying about the, my partner's ego, but worrying about, I want them to like me so much. It's this codependence of like, I need their love. So if I do this, it'll feel like they're loving me. It's like, I'm kind of like doing it for myself. Like I'm trying to trick my brain. Like, is that, does that make sense? Yeah, totally. I mean, you want to like, orgasm for many can be like a validation check checkpoint, check mark, checkpoint. Yeah. <laughs> and so that totally makes sense. Yeah, so I get that. Like I, someone recently, um, oh, I was in an acting class. That's where it was. And there was this, uh, someone was doing a scene from a TV show um, and the scene was a girl telling her partner, uh, he caught her masturbating and she, you know, says to him, she goes, oh my God, I, I think I might've just had my first real orgasm. And, you know, of course he was like, what? So you've been faking it with me? She's like, no, I haven't been faking with you. But like, what I thought was an orgasm was like, just like the a version of what I just experienced was, which was this like full blown thing. And so in my mind, I'm like, oh my God, that's actually my deepest fear. Like what if what I've been experiencing this whole time is like, just like the tip of the iceberg as far as orgasms go, like it's, that's like a scary thing to me. Like, how do we know what a real orgasm feels like? It's so subjective. I mean, even as a seasoned masturbator and orgasm haver myself, they can range from little like sneeze to like, I'm going to pass out, see stars, cross-eyed kind of orgasm. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the person. And this is where, again, the situation, the masturbation, the uh, time you take to get yourself in a comfortable state of mind or just have a really long, prolonged end session that knowledge is right you know what it's like when you're with a partner mm -hmm. but when you're with you there's no timeline you there's no pressure to perform a certain way you're in control of everything so you can really relish and do sensations and be like wow this solo of me is like next level yeah question masturbating by hand i'm not good at okay. masturbating by hand i've talked about this a million times on the podcast but I just like, I'm eventually like, I'm going to be here for fucking ever. Is there an average time length it takes for someone, a woman to masturbate by hand versus uh, with uh, 
a vibrator or a uh, the the womanizer. <laughs> I I mean I love fast facts and numbers I could throw at you, but it's so dependent on the person. How aroused are you? Are you stressed out? Are you thinking different things? Are you feeling okay? like are you taking any information? Um, are you like really putting the pressure on yourself to orgasm? Or are you just kind of like free flowing, letting it happen? I mean, I'm sure there are some who's like, who are like, I could do it in 90 seconds. And there's mm -hmm. some who are like, I could do it all day long and nothing's going to happen. And that's okay. That's just, again, the of bodies. And if you, if you're a toy user, cause you don't want to use your hands, that's okay. I think there's a big stigma around having to use toys or introducing toys into an relationship. It's yeah. not that it's like cheating or it's replacing your partner. It's mm -hmm. just another way to experience pleasure. Mm -hmm. The ends justify the means. <laughs> yeah. One of the things I read um, in your biology is that, in your biology, in your biography, is that you are very <laughs> mindful of inclusion and you bring sensitivity to ethnic diversity rooted in your own complex heritage. Based on, you know, a client or whomever you're working with, do you approach sexuality in different ways based on, you know, uh, their ethnic makeup? You know, if, you know, I'm a, you know, super sexually liberal, like white Jewish woman, um, do you approach things differently if you're speaking to someone who's maybe like a conservative Francophone from like Quebec, Canada, um, you know, is there, how is that, how does it differ between cultures and ethnicities? I think when it comes, I always want to be mindful of the experience of the audience. So, um, I'm not Jewish. My best friend is Jewish. So if mm -hmm. I knew I was speaking to a primarily Jewish audience, I would definitely her and be like, what should I call you? you know? Um, but I want to be mindful of the different things that might be impacting one group that one group might not know of. So just thinking of like, really quick off the top of my head, vulva coloration or hair distribution. Oh, so interesting. We see a lot of mainstream porn with Caucasian bodies with pretty streamlined, one kind of looking labia. Pretty, but when it comes to people who are not, in, there's all kinds of different colorations and configurations and pubic hair looking uh, configurations on their bodies. And so helping them realize that what their vulva looks like and like asshole bleaching, what the ass looks like is still normal and good and valid, even though it's not what we're seeing in mainstream point of view or talking about penis and in regards to circum or looking length or testicles. So just making sure I'm trying to touch on all the diversity that's being seen in in bodies and also culture so again Jewish circumcision mm -hmm. and then for those who aren't going to be circumcised normalizing that foreskin that's okay too yeah what is your day-to-day -day? like what is what does your job look like on a day-to-day -day basis as a sexologist I wake up and I feed my dog <laughs> Perfect. and then I have a leisurely morning where I try I press try not to work until noon because for me I'm not functional in the morning I leave mornings for because I don't like feeling pressure to wake up and have to like do stuff it's not good so leisurely morning, have breakfast do my domestic things whatever then noon to like five I'm going hard so that's checking my emails responding to media inquiries um prepping gigs um writing articles researching and then time for lunch <laughs> and then at five that's my like soft stop I usually say I'll go till 8 p.m because I'm on the east coast so 8 p.m is 5 p.m California time mm -hmm. so I leave myself open to that time but I really try to get the bulk of my work done from noon to five because that's when I'm most active because if it's nighttime I'm kind of like oh I want to wind down and I'm trying to be more mindful of having a hard delineation between work and pleasure because when you work for yourself and at home you know mm -hmm. social media can be for you know professional reasons but then it's like oh puppies that's not for for life uh, uh, so uh, really trying to have a good balance and have hard working time and also dedicated leisure time do you do you have i'm like wondering what your in, interaction is because when you hear doctor you think doctor patient 
Um, do you interact? Are you are you clinical mainly, or are you as well with patient patients, clients, however they're referred to? So I'm not a clinician. So someone who has like a medical background or the psychological background would be a clinician. I'm not a coach or so see people on a current basis. I am an educator. So for me, that's speaking on college campuses or speaking in women's groups or speaking at other expos or hosting private events or traveling to optional resorts and teaching sex classes. So it's like I'm the keeper of education information. I try to give you all that you need and then help you make the best decisions that work for you in your situation. Rewind. You just said going to resorts <laughs> to teach sex classes. Yeah. <laughs> where where does one go? What happens? Tell me everything. <laughs> um, well, first of all, you bring your sister as your <laughs> as your plus one because okay. you're single. So you have a fun time explaining to everyone that that's not your partner, it's your sister, but you guys don't have sex. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. So um, I've spoken at Hedonism, which is a clothing optional resort, and they're very sex positive. And so I was teaching like oral sex classes and like anal play classes, and couples would come and learn. And if they wanted to try it out with their partner in class, I was there to answer questions. Um, it was hands off. I just observed. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it was really, really fun to both be in that situation with people who are comfortable with their bodies and actually see like real authentic sex happening because otherwise we're watching porn to see sex happen. Yeah. Um, right before quarantine, my sister and I went on our first cruise and it was our first swinger cruise. So it was a whole carnival ship full of swingers. And I taught sex classes again on that ship. And I think I taught edging and I think another anal class. Uh -huh. And it was just so nice because I like being naked. Mm -hmm. I like being able to like go to dinner and then be like, I want to swim in the pool and just take my dress off and be, you know, there in the Do water. It. So it'd be nice to both see body diversity, see couples happy and experiencing sexuality and also seeing couples make breakthroughs or yeah. try new things. So I've had a couple instances where I've helped people who think they have erectile problems fix it. I had one couple, it was so cute. They were in their seventies and this woman had made her partner ejaculate in her mouth or by hand because it just took her. And so that was the edging class. And sure enough, they were like one of the last people there. He finally came in her mouth. And I was like, oh, this is, this is so great. But it's like you know, a weird thing. You can't share that on Facebook. Like, hey, class, a couple had mm -hmm. a cum shot in the mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> so I just showed it with the right audience. But it's, it's really good work. I... See, it's so funny. I said the other day to a friend, I was like, I just want to be like the horny old lady. Like, I <laughs> hope I, I hope I never stop being like a horny person. Um, cause I just feel like it's such a fun way to go through life. Um, question for me personally, I enjoy giving blowjobs. What would you say to someone, uh, who's having trouble, you know, getting their, uh, partner to ejaculate? What would you say, like, top three tips to keep in mind when giving a blowjob? Um, consistency in your stroke or touch, um, especially if they're making signals or signs that they're getting close and don't suddenly switch it up because then yeah. they're going to be like, oh, I lost it. Um, maybe doing more pressure than you think with your hand because chances are when they are masturbating, they're really giving a nice grip. And so you don't want to be like loose. So mm -hmm. be confident in your stroke. Mm -hmm. And I just, again, asking them, even if like, it might seem weird mid blowjob to be like, do you even like this? But ask them, say, hey, do you like it when I do this? Or this technique, I noticed you kind of like away. Was that something you're not into? Or like, hey, do you like your butt down while I stroke your shaft? You know, ask them for the feedback because I'm sure they'll be more than happy to give it to you. Chances are they're happy you're just touching your penis anyway, but to get specific and be like, I want to make cum. They Again, communication. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every single time, communication. Um, what, when, in your personal sex life, what are your favorite things? What are the things that you're like, you look oh. forward to about sex? Because I, I, uh, I dated a guy early in, in quarantine and he was like, I've never met anybody who gets more excited to have sex. Like every time I have sex, I'm always like, eee! 
we get this, this, this sex. <laughs> like, what is it that like gets you like revved up about a sexual experience? Honestly, best case scenario, the slow burn of like teasing and like sexting all day long, making me like <sighs> slow crock pot heated up until it's like dinner time. And I'm like, we're ready. Let's let's get it on. <laughs> That's really fun. So really good. Day. And it's like the playfulness of it and a partner who's just like really enthused about it and yeah. who's confident in their skills and open-minded to try new things um and who isn't weirded out by what I do <laughs> that's a yeah. big thing with both meeting people and then having sex with people there have been some who have been super super weird or super gross like I don't want to be a notch on your belt or mm -hmm. some kind of like trophy like yeah I had sex with a sexologist and it was terrible like <laughs> yeah so, and someone who's communicative so yeah I think the bar is pretty low those things matter I mean all of those things you just mentioned are super those are things that I love like I love a good I love sexual tension. I could let sexual tension build for, I mean, months. Like I could, it's so <laughs> much fun. Like there's this one guy who I was seeing, we met, he lives in LA, but we met when he was out of town on a job and he was there for two months. So we had like two months of sexual tension building up. And I was like, we are not having any phone sex. We're not having any FaceTime sex, whatever. None of that. I'm like, I literally just want sexual tension to build till you get here. And it was the best idea I've ever had. And, ah. and yeah, it's like, you're like getting that crock pot ready. And it really is like such a fun explosion of, of, you know, all this like anticipation and buildup. Um, I, I, I loved what you said about people being okay with what you do. Um, I, I experienced that as a comedian and also as a host of a podcast where I speak with uh, sex workers or people who are a very sexually liberated, you know, oftentimes like I, you and I could probably sit for hours and have the most matter of fact conversation about anal ever. Like, like it's nothing like no blushing it, like we could talk about every nook and cranny of a person's body and never at any point be like Ooh. but like a normal person is like so like you just like talk about sex like that's so yeah. <laughs> that's so weird and it's like yeah no 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 sex can be matter of fact like me wanting to talk about sex isn't me being like we should fuck it's more like yeah, it's not an invitation just yeah, yeah. I do for a job <laughs> yeah and I think you know, perfectly said, it's not an invitation and being able for I'm someone sure gets, to like, say exhausting. Oh, sorry. Exhausting. I'm sure it gets exhausting for you when you say you're to me and someone's like, Oh, tell me a joke or like, honey, oh, exactly. Just, like, uh, exactly. Job interview. What's happening right now? <laughs> it really is to be able to be accepted for that. Um, and it's not, it's, so when I, when I, you know, and like, I have like things, like I have a foot daddy. I talk about it on the podcast all the time. And there's a dude who pays for pictures of my feet and videos and whatever. So when I start dating someone, yes. I have to be like, okay, so here's a few things, you know? And then, you know, there've <laughs> been a couple of guys who are like, so like, what are you like? Are you like super kinky? And I'm like, I mean, yeah, but like, it's, it, it isn't this, like, I'm not telling you this so I can like turn you on. I'm like telling you this because I feel like it's an, an inventory about me that you might need, need. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it really is interesting. Like when you try to be communicative, sometimes it kind of backfires. Yeah. Well, it's just, it takes the right person to not make it be like exploitive or like make it weird, you know, like be cool like yeah just it's like reductive like because i'm a sexologist doesn't mean i want to like i don't know have freaky kinky spin yeah. my, my eyes pour wax on my nose kind of like sex hit me with a bunch of nettles and stiff butt cheeks like relax this is date one okay like yeah, yeah. you're like, like that's date off. that's date 10 okay yeah, you can like, slow it down guy <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, that is the most deeply relatable statement I could ever imagine. Where do you live, by the way? Yeah. Michigan. I'm from Michigan. Where are you in Michigan? <gasps> Grand Rapids, Michigan. I'm from Detroit. <gasps> oh, 
Okay. Okay. I'm going to be in Michigan <laughs> next week. Um, okay. We have to figure out how to get together and hang out. Yeah. Like we, I have to have you as a real life friend. Like <laughs> friend. <laughs> it's so great to, to meet women who can just, you know, speak about these things. And I like, love that you're like a sciencey nerdy chick about it too. Um, I'm like, I, I, one of the things I think that I find most fascinating about the combination of, uh, sex and biology is, is pheromones. You know, the idea that opposites yeah. attract when it comes to pheromonal attraction. And it's like, it's like, I, I don't know. I just find that so fascinating that we can like smell on a pheromonal level, a level that can determine our compatibility. I mean, that kind of makes sense from a bio biological perspective. Like you don't want to be with someone who will see related to you. So like, don't have sex with your brother or cousin. Yeah. Ugh, no judgment if you yeah. do that, but also don't do that. But also don't do <laughs> so that. So it makes sense. Yeah, please don't. But it's also like, yeah, we don't want to do that biologically. Obviously we're humans and we're not slaves to our, you know, base or instincts, but it's just like interesting. That's, it's just interesting. It's like, huh. That's kind of like built in us. Like, mm, yeah. it doesn't feel right. <laughs> That's I, when I learned about that, I learned that I learned that, um, relative to why animals in the wild that are, you know, brother and sister don't, uh, mate because there's no animal pheromonal attraction. And I was like, Oh, Oh, that makes perfect sense. And it's like, it's such a fascinating thing that <laughs> You, in humans, your pheromonal attraction can change if a woman is on birth control or if someone is wearing cologne and it's like, oh my gosh, we're doing all these like modern luxuries and it's taking away the opportunity to have like, not that we all need to procreate, but like to have like these like, you know, survival of the fittest, you know, type offspring. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm just thinking of like, you know, the classic t-shirt test and it's like, you know, that's interesting to let, to know, but it's also like, okay, so maybe you don't really like the smell of your partner or that's like not even a thing you're aware of and it still works out. That's interesting too, because it's like, hey, biologically, you guys weren't a really good match, but socially, relationship wise, it's working. Mm -hmm. So what factors are at play there? Interesting. It's interesting. I, I would love to like, <clears throat> do like a case study of couples who um who are you know have a greater ge genetic disparity and see what their offspring looks like um and like the health and like the I don't know the uh you know the genetic what what genetic predisposition the hybrid vigor <laughs> dude Mendel's peas hybrid vigor <laughs> <laughs> and to see what you know <laughs> compare compare offspring based on you know the parents genetic disparity it's so, it's just all of it's so fascinating yeah I mean that's me I'm the hybrid vigor <laughs> what, my mom is white and Japanese and my dad is black and Native American oh so. you are not. <laughs> you are yeah you're gonna survive everything like your <laughs> immune system is like a superhero. That's like, come at me, come on. I got everything, you know, you're fine. <laughs> you said you have kids as well. Oh, I don't have kids. I don't want kids. I have a dog. He's my son. You have a dog. Okay. <laughs> you don't want, you don't want kids? No. Yeah. Well, neither do I. I'm not like, it never, it never, that, that never went off for me. I was never like, give me a baby. I'm like, give me a farm <laughs> with dogs. I mean, I was curious about it, but never to the point of, oh, I should do this one day. I just never saw future down the road, Meg, with kids. Yeah. Uh, and now that all of my friends are breeding and having kids, I'm getting to experience that. And I say, I'm so happy for you, <laughs> but yeah. I'm just like, whoa, no, it's just not for me. So I'm yeah. going to be cool Aunt Meg forever. <laughs> yeah, same. Aunt Nicole, crazy Aunt Nicole in California. I'll take it. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, Dr. Megan, um, it was great having you on the show. 
Um, I am absolutely going to uh, see you when I come to Michigan so we can sit and have coffee, socially distanced, of course. Um, but I'm really excited. I'm really excited to read your book, Playing Without a Partner. Everybody, when it comes out on May 11th? Yeah. May 11th this year, you guys, Playing Without a Partner. I know there's probably a lot of guys um, who listen to this podcast who are single, um, or maybe there aren't. Maybe there's, you know, guys who are in relationships and, you know, they're listening to this with their significant other. But either way, um, grab her book. Um, you know, if you're single, it'll probably help you. If you're not single, it'll probably help you also. Um, because any sex advice is good advice for everyone. Yes. Um, now, if you want to let everyone know where to find you on social media, so they can you yeah. know, reach out to you and talk to you if they need it. You can find me at sexologian.com and I'm at Megan on all the social media handles. Love it. Love it. I'm going to find you on all of those things. Um, and then I'll Yay. see you when I get to Michigan. Yeah. Thank you so much, Megan. It was really, really amazing having you. Yeah. Thank you for having me on the podcast. This was so good. <laughs> okay. Thanks guys for tuning in. <clears throat> Thanks guys for tuning in. <clears throat> oh my gosh. I can't clear my throat. <clears> throat> Let me clear my throat. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. Anyway. So Thank you for another amazing episode of Love Her Podcast. Again, I'm your host, Nicole Amy Schreiber. Uh, and uh, as always, we are brought to you by loveherfeet.com, where you can.com. See you guys later. Bye.